This is your instructor, Ben Kewitt, welcoming you back to Fullerton College pre-press classes, print 75 and 77 respectively, and combined. Today we're going to look at some advanced text control, some text frame options, as well as some um, styles. Styles is the coolest thing ever, and we'll get to that in a bit. So last time we imported our Common Sense or other book from Project Gutenberg, and we placed it into four different frames on four pages connected so that the text flows from one frame to the next. But now let's take a look at some ways of formatting this to make it interesting. First, let's look at the tool of text frame options. The slow mouse way is object text frame options. But you can also see that command B, I still hear the word Apple in my head from the old days when Apple computers had apples instead of the command key. It was Apple B, but command B. So I am now able to change the number of columns and things in here. Let's make it two columns. And let's and it still has a gutter, that's fine. You can have indent spacing if you want and change vertical justification. You can ignore text wrap or not. And I will just, we'll go into text wrap later as well. So let's say, okay. So now in the first box, you can see, I now have two columns of text, a little bit more newspaper-y looking. Let's do that for this one. You can also do more if you want, but at some point you'll get to a point where the, oh, you know me. Let's take this as logical extreme. Let's do six. Six will be bad enough. Six columns. Six columns is so bad that none of the words in this whole document are short enough. You can't even do common sense because the, the columns are too narrow and it can't fit an entire word. So let's try that again. Let's try five. Five columns lets me get some of the words into a page, um, but not all of them. Let's try that again. Four should work. No, wow, even four doesn't work. Three columns does work, and it, you basically you get too small and stuff no longer fits to the point where it's even worth doing, and it says no thank you. If you make your text size smaller, you can fit it. So let's take a look at some of the text controls. I'm gonna undo a few times back to where I want it with just the two. So there are some things still left in this document that I imported from when it would lived on a website, like these hyperlink, hyperlink chapters. And everybody knows it's tacky. And if you ever see this printed on a document, it, that they created it probably in Microsoft Word. And when they typed in a website or obvious email, the program underlined it and made it blue. And uh, yeah, let's get rid of that. That'll be one thing to look at. Uh, we'll also look at changing everything else. So we have these in place. Let's look at some of the other uh, adjustments you can make. Some of it is pretty obvious. You guys are already familiar with, I'm sure. If you select a paragraph, let's go with paragraph selections, just in case we're not aware. If you click once inside a word, it places your cursor wherever you clicked, between letters, after words, Wherever you put it, it gives you a single spot to start typing from. If you double click, 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 you get yourself one word. Now, just for clarification sense here, let me type something gobbledygooky on here. That was random typing. So note that when I hit my double clicks now, those are not actual words. InDesign will take your word for it that those are words or maybe some sort of proper noun that it doesn't know how to spell and it's not gonna try and tell you they aren't words. InDesign considers a word a series of characters separated by spaces. So between two spaces, are those are the words. So if I double click, it gets me a word. Three clicks, one, two, three, gets me one line of text. Two, three, four clicks gets me an entire paragraph. Now, paragraph here has some other meanings in other applications in life. If you're talking about an English class or a history class where you're writing documents and you are, it's your job to generate all this copy, then a paragraph is a series of sentences all combined to support a specific thesis, blah, 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 blah. We are printers. We let somebody else handle that part. Our job is to set them up so they look right and they print clearly and people are able to read the information in it. For us printers, what matters is whether or not return has been hit. 
but that's not exactly true. We're not seeing the whole picture. Let's take a look at something just so you can see it here. You guys ready to see the other side? This is one of those moments where you suddenly see the angels that have been there the whole time. Let's go. Or ninjas, the ninjas that have been there the whole time. Either way, it's pretty cool. So we're gonna go to view. I'm oh, sorry, it's type show hidden characters. Boom. Suddenly the page is lit up with hidden characters. Every space looks like a little light blue bullet. Whoops, some other things here show up as well. This right here, this character looks like a P kind of, that's backwards. That's called a pill crow. That is the editor's mark that says paragraph stops here. In the programming language that produces InDesign, that it's looking for when it's considering where a paragraph starts and stops, what it's looking for is this specific character. When InDesign sees a pill crow, the paragraph is over. It's over. That's it. No more. It doesn't matter if it was one word, one letter, just a space and nothing else. In fact, if I let me zoom out and do this to you for a second, if I hit return, 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 return. Every time you hit return, there's another pill crow. So even spaces and empty parts of your uh, text, as far as the computer is concerned for typesetting reasons, is still a piece of text. It's just a different type of coding. Instead of a code that says show letter, the code the computer is seeing is saying go to a new line or leave a blank spot here. Similar to actually setting lead type. If you're setting lead type letter by letter to print a book on an old printing press, Ben Franklin style, then the spaces between letters are just blocks of lead that don't have a word on them. So it's not that strange if you understand the idea of le type setting lead type, and this isn't so strange. Anyways, this is a lot, so I'm gonna turn it off. We don't need to see it now. So one, two, three, four takes a whole paragraph. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five takes the whole document. All of it. The whole document. Five clicks, whole document. So once again, one places a cursor somewhere to edit, two gets the word, three gets the line, four gets the, two, three, four gets the pair. Sorry, let me try that again. One, two, three, four gets the paragraph, and one, two, three, four, five gets all the text within that connected text frame. That was a lot, just talking about selecting text. So, Let's look at a thing or two before I run out of time on this video. If you select, I like to select a whole paragraph when I do this or a whole line. The text up at the top here, you can change your type. Times is a somehow respectable typeface that's honestly about a half step better than Comic Sans. It's not the best type. It's in fact kind of ugly compared to other serif types. So let's change this to a better typeface for now. I like Baskerville. You don't have to use it. I will. However, historically speaking, this original document would have set, been set in Caslon, because Caslon was the official typeface of the British Empire at this time. Garamond was the French typeface. Jensen was the Dutch type. They're all slightly different. They all work a little bit better for their individual languages. So if you're trying to make a Declaration of Independence or you're trying to make a common sense or any of the other uh, writings of this time, and it's in English, it should be in Caslon. Anyways, I like Baskerville, even though it's a little bit historically anachronistic here. It's my favorite type for a lot of things. Um, I have a minute left, so I'll give you this uh, little bit of advice before I move on. All typefaces kind of speak to you in voices and accents and makes you see a different type of speaker. For instance, if you see something written in a cursive type and it looks all elegant, think of someone inviting you to their wedding. You can kind of hear a person giving formal announcements and it feels very fancy. When someone writes in Old English, which is not the correct name for it, but think black letter, Old English, Gothic, storybook typefaces, you can kind of hear the hear ye, hear ye of the guy standing there in his medieval garb yelling from the corner of a street next to a castle. Uh, when you write in Comic Sans, you can kind of see some guy trying to be funny who's not funny and you really just want to punch him. Um, but when you write in Baskerville, Baskerville is the official font of your proper Oxford professor type sitting in an overstuffed leather armchair in a coat with leather arm patches, smoking a pipe, explaining things to you the way they are. It somehow carries a trustworthiness of information. If you write in Baskerville, 
this has actually been psychologically proven in some uh, survey tests done on public where it's a more believable typeface. People were given the same information in several fonts, including Helvetica, Baskerville, and a few others. And they found that while all people understood what they were reading, more people believed the statements to be true when they were written in Baskerville. So what's my tip to you? Not for my class. Actually, it works in my class, but for different reasons. When you're writing papers for classes in college, be it an English class, a social science class, a science class, whatever you're writing in, whether or not you're 100% sure about what you're writing, set your type to Baskerville. It'll give you just a percent or two more of believability on what you've given. Don't believe me, this is how I got through school. If you know your fonts, you can help yourself and help your credibility just by using the right ones. If you give your teacher something in Baskerville, even if they ask for times, A, they probably won't know the difference between times and Baskerville because they look similar. But B, sorry, B, if they don't notice, they might just believe you a little bit more. And C, if they do notice, like me, and they notice that you've chosen to use Baskerville, they'll say, oh, hey, it's Baskerville. Good choice, you. I have used Baskerville for many great things beyond just school papers. Uh, whenever I really wanted a job, I would always set my cover letters and my resumes to Baskerville and help me feel just a little bit more trustworthy and correct and knowledgeable to the people I sent it to. That's about it for this video because I'm running out of time for my YouTube time cap. I will talk to you guys soon with a few more controls later.